Good morning, everyone. Coming to the today's seminar, that is Diagnosis and Treatment Planning in Implant Dentistry. These are the contents. Coming to introduction, proper diagnosis dictates the appropriate treatment plan. Inadequately planned treatment and inadequately informed patients, even when well executed, will result in less than ideal treatment satisfaction. So coming to treatment workflow, so uh, to select the number of implants or the treatment plan, we need to have a proper medical history followed by oral evaluation, diagnostic models and radiographs on, base, uh, with, uh, on which we decide the number of implants and the uh, bone grafting and the type of processes required. Now the, uh, this can be divided into an initial appointment that and then phase one dentistry followed by a peri-implant reconstructive surgery phase which has stage one that is the implant placement, stage two that is the secondary stage and then followed by maintenance phase. Coming to consultation, we have an initial consultation and interaction with the patient followed by which we have a medical evaluation. So the first section, uh, it is divided into three sections that is the first section, second section and the third section. So in the first section, we basically have the patient interview uh, in which we ask the medical history of the patient followed by the physical examination, which is the hands-on evaluation and the vital signs of the patient. Now any uh, drug history within the period of six months or uh, the medical history within the period of six months has to be recorded. In the physical examination, we have an extra oral examination and the intraoral examination. Now in second section, we do the lab analysis, which is the complete blood count, bleeding test and the biochemical profile of the patient. In the third section, we, uh, we have an ASA classification, uh, that is uh, ASA 1 for the normal healthy patient without the systemic disease, ASA 2 is for the mild to moderate uh, systemic disease, ASA 3 is for severe systemic disease, uh, ASA 4 is a severe systemic disease which uh, incapacitates and, constant and is constant like threat to life and ASA 5 is a morbidant patient. Now elective implant surgery is not indicated for ASA 4 and 5 kind of patient. Now coming to the contraindications of the implant, so the, uh, there are absolute contraindications and relative contraindications. So the absolute contraindication is the re uh, recent myocardial infarction. Uh, if there is a uh, severe renal disorder or radiotherapy in progress, a relative contraindication is a prolonged use of corticosteroids, uh, chemotherapy in progress, uh, cardiovascular disease or any alcohol or drug abuse. According to new recommendations, the control systemic disease should not be considered as a risk factor for dental implant. Studies have demonstrated that the survival rate of dental implant placed in a medically compromised patient who suffer from control systemic disease or smoke does not indicate a total or a partial contraindication for the placement of dental implants. Now coming to certain medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, hypertension. Now patient with hypertension needs to have a proper, med uh, should be on proper medication and have a controlled high, uh, uh, blood pressure. Uh, 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 patient who have uh, diabetes uh, need to maintain the glucose blood le uh, sugar level for implant placement or and for uh, for a uh, better implant prognosis. Now patient with bone disorder ha uh, have a certain 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 recommendation that need to be followed. Uh, uh, in, a in a retrospective study, uh, dental imp uh, so in this study, basically uh, 34 patients with, uh, with diabetes were treated with uh, Bronomark implants. So now at the time of the second stage, uh, 214 implants had also integrated and the survival rate of was of 94%, whereas uh, only one imp uh, failure was seen amongst the 177 implants and the uh, final so the clinical survival rate was 99%. Coming to medication, so patients who are like on bisphosphonates, the invasive dental procedure should be avoided in patients with IV bisphosphonate. Oral nitrogen containing has low probability of causing osteonecrosis and the medical consultation should be done of the patient who is of, uh, who's taking medication for more than three years. Now in a study, uh, the outcomes of the uh, dental implants were uh, assessed for taking oral bisphosphonates in a review of 115 cases. The conclusion was that the oral bisphosphonate therapy did not appear to have significant effect on the implant success. So the implant surgery on patients receiving bisphosphonate therapy did not result in any osteoradionecrosis.
uh, now patients who are on anticoagulants like warfarin sodium uh, the uh, uh, the standard dose of 2 to 3.5 uh, does not need the discontinuation of the drug but if the dose is more than 4 uh, physician consultation is needed Uh, uh similarly in aspirin if the dose is more than 100 mg a physician consultation is required uh, before the procedure can take place now coming to lifestyle related factors so lifestyle related in alcohol use smoking is not an absolute contraindication uh, there will be uh, three times more bone loss in this because of vasoconstriction and decreased blood flow so a patient needs to at least stop this uh, two weeks before uh, uh, at the end uh, should maintain it till eight weeks after the implant placement alcohol use is basically it has direct effect on bone uh, it can increase the resorption and can affect and impair the uh, um, remodeling process uh coming to the uh, an art, uh, prospective study so basically uh, uh, they conducted uh, to explore the possible link between the peri implant bone loss and the habit of the tobacco smoking and alcohol consumption so uh, it concluded that the daily alcohol consumption in tobacco use may have a negative effect on the predictable long term implant treatment outcomes producing peri implant bone loss and compromising the restorative treatment <coughs> coming to peri implant prosthodontic so it is divided into three part that is overall evaluation specific criteria and pre treatment processes overall evaluation as again uh, five parts that is maxillary anterior tooth position occlusal vertical dimension mandibular incisal edge maxillary posterior plane and mandibular posterior plane now coming to maxillary anterior tooth position so basically the labial position of the teeth is first evaluated uh, related to the support of the maxillary lip so a vertical line is drawn through the subnasal point and the perpendicular to the frankfurt horizontal plane now the maxillary lip should be 1 to 2 mm anterior to this line and the lower lip even with the with the line uh, and the chin should be 2 mm behind the line then the vertical position of the maxillary anterior teeth is assessed so the ideal position is determined by the canine uh, to lip in this uh, repose position so a horizontal line is drawn from canine tip to the canine tip and the central incisors are 1 to 2 mm longer so the position is consistent uh, within 1 mm regardless of the age or the sex of the patient uh, then we have to assess for the existing occlusal vertical dimension so there are different methods to assess it that is a subjective method and the objective method so subjective methods could be aesthetic uh, resting into occlusal distance and closest uh, speaking space whereas objective methods can be facial measurement and the radiographic method now coming to mandibular incisal edge position so basically the incisal guidance is often evaluated on mounted diagnostic models a steep incisal guidance helps in avoidance of posterior interferences in protrusive or lateral movement however the steeper the incisal guide angle the greater is force applied to the anterior teeth and crowns this may present a significant problem for an anterior single tooth implant replacement if existing guidance is shallow it may be necessary to plan recontouring or prosthetic restoration of the posterior teeth an existing occlusion plane should have a harmonious occlusion with maximum intercuspation and canine or mutually protected occlusion now it can be corrected by a uh, different uh, odontoplasty or uh, endodontic therapy or crowns and it should be parallel to campus plane with a uh, proper curve of occlusion now there are different criteria like uh, which we'll discuss for the lip line we a uh, high lip line uh, uh, low lip line and the uh, uh, medium lip line so the mandibular low, uh, or the lower lip line is basically assessed during the pronunciation of the s sound or this uh, s uh, sibilants now some patients may expose uh, an uh, entire uh, anterior mandibular teeth and uh, gingival contour crown edge space so uh, it is measured from the crest of the bone to the plane of occlusion of posterior teeth and incisal edge of the anterior now a crown edge space uh, is a vertical cantilever and hence a force magnifier uh, for an fp1 processes it should be 8 to 12 mm whereas for removal processes it has to be more than 12 mm excessive crown edge space the treatment planning options uh, to decrease the stresses are to shorten the cantilever minimize and the buccal and the lingual offset load increase the number of implant increase the diameter of the implant uh, then uh, remove uh, remove the removable restoration during the sleeping hours 
to reduce the granite phase uh, we need uh, structural integrity problems of the restoration uh, increases with the reduced chs uh, surgical procedures during the implant placement may increase the chs and the complications of insufficient chs may be uh, by increased by the surgical position of the implant a uh, temporomandibular joint uh, should be evaluated externally or palpated so uh, there should uh, no abnormal sign or symptom should be present and normal mouth opening should be around of 40 mm uh, the extraction of the teeth with hopeless or guarded prognosis uh, there is a uh, rule that is a rule of 0 5 10 year rule so uh, the uh, prognosis if the prognosis is more than 10 years we keep the teeth if If it is five to ten years, uh, we uh, either do an implant restoration or we uh, use the tooth as a living pontic. If it is less than five years, we extract the tooth and graft the site. Arch form. So arch form basically influences the fixed prosthesis treatment plan of the dentulous uh, premaxilla. There are three typical dentate forms: that is square, ovoid, and tapering. Now the two horizontal lines are drawn. Uh, the first line by 60 inches of papilla and connects the tip of the uh, canine. Uh, then uh, the second line is parallel along the facial uh, position uh, of the central incisor. So the distance between these lines determines the uh, arch form. Uh, in now, basically uh, the uh, square arch form has the uh, cantilever anterior cantilever of more than eight. 8 mm over as 8 to 12 mm and tapering as uh, 12 mm so uh, the number of implant depends upon the type of arch form that is there so if the uh, there is a square arch form the number of implant is uh, uh, 2 if it is over it is 3 and if it tapering it is 4 The cantilever posterior section should not exceed 2.5 times of the AP spread and the tapered arch form provides more favorable anterior posterior spread Coming to soft tissue assessment, so the assessment can be done by direct visual assessment, uh, direct measurement using endodontic, uh, using the endodontic, using the endodontic spreader, endodontic files and calipers. Uh, then we can use the TRAN method, uh, that is the uh, probe transparency method, in which we basically uh, place the Uh, probe uh, to the uh, sulcus. If uh, if it is not visible to the sulcus, that means it is a, a thick gingival uh, type. Then we can use a certain scan like CBCT. If the gingival thickness is of more than two mm, it is considered thick biotype, and if it is less than one point five mm, it is referred to as thin uh, tissue biotype. Then coming to uh, Manual palpation. So, with thumb and fingers, the dentulous area can be palpated uh, to get a general overview of the available bone and the soft tissue. So, a sharpened periodontal probe can be used to measure the soft tissue thickness after anesthetizing the tissue. Coming to mesh classification of the bone density. So, uh, D1 is basically dense cortical bone, which is seen mostly in anterior mandible. D2 is porous cortical and coarse trabecular bone, which is seen mostly in anterior mandible, posterior mandible, and anterior maxilla. D3 is porous cortical bone seen mostly in the anterior uh, maxilla, posterior uh, maxilla, and the mandible. And D4 is fine trabecular bone seen mostly in the posterior maxilla. Coming to Atwood classification, so it is basically a uh, pre-extraction, post-extraction, a uh, high well-rounded, knife edge, low well-rounded, and depressed. Coming to available bone, so basically it describes the external architecture of the contour. of the bone present in the dentulous area considered for the implant available available bone can be measured by different parameters so the available bone height so uh, cbct survey is the most common method for determination of the available bone height the height of the available available bone is measured from crest of the dentulous ridge to the opposing landmark now the anterior region of the jaw has the greatest height because of the maxillary sinus and inferior alveolar nerve limits this dimension in the posterior region The maxillary canine eminence region or the first premolar is uh, equal to is a uh, greater height of the available bone. Now the suggested minimum bone height for a predictable long term endodontal implant survival is 12 mm. The available bone height in a dental site is most important dimension for implant consideration. Coming to available bone width, so the width of the available bone between the facial and the lingual plates of the crest of the potential implant site. 
Now minimum bone width uh, for a 4 mm diameter root form uh, is around is 7 mm to allow a greater than 1.5 mm on buckle and minimum of 1 mm on lingual. So the crest aspect of the residual ridge is the mandible is often cortical in nature and exhibits greater density than the underlying trabecular bone uh, regions. Unlike the anterior mandible, the anterior maxilla often does not follow the triangular shaped anatomy. So the palatal plate of the bone is more parallel to the facial plate in the maxilla. And the edentulous ridge exhibits a labial concavity in the incisor area like an hourglass configuration. Available bone length. So as a general rule, the implant should be at least 1.5 mm from the adjacent tooth and 3 mm from the adjacent implant. Now this dimension allows for the surgical error but for also compensates for the uh, width of the uh, um, uh, width of the implant or the uh, tooth uh, crestal defect. Coming to bone angulation, so the initial alveolar bone angulation represents the natural tooth root trajectory in relation to occlusal plane. Ideally, it is perpendicular to the plane of occlusion which is aligned with the forces of occlusion and is parallel to the long axis of the prosthetic restoration. The incisal and the occlusal surface of the teeth follow the curve of the basin and the curve of speed. In posterior mandible, the submandibular fossa mandates implant placement with increasing angulation as it progresses distally. For mandibular second premolar, it is 10 degrees. For mandibular first premolar, it is 15 degrees. And second molar, it is 20 to 25 degrees. Coming to the prosthodontic classification, it is uh, divided into uh, uh, five types that is FP1, that is a fixed prosthesis that replaces only crown. FP2 is a fixed prosthesis, replaces the, uh, replaces the crown and the portion of the root. And FP3 is a fixed prosthesis that replaces the portion of the uh, crown and the gingiva. RP4 is a removal prosthesis which is supported by the implants and RP5 is a removal prosthesis supported by soft tissue and the implant. Coming to the division of the available bone, according to Mission Judy 1985, it is based on the natural resorption pattern in each region. Now, division A is the abundant bone. So, the width is of around more than 6 mm, height is of around more than 12 mm, and mesiodistal length is of more than 7 mm. So, it is an ideal uh, 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 division of the bone for the placement of the implant. Now, division B is a sufficient bone. Uh, so, as the bone resolves, the width of the available bone first decreases as an expense of the facial cortical plate because the cortical bone is thicker on the lingual aspect of the alveolar bone, especially in the anterior region of the jaw. So, uh, in, uh, in this uh, division B kind of bone, uh, we can convert it into a division A kind of bone uh, if uh, with, with the use of a smaller diameter of the implant or doing osteoplasty or using of the graft. Then division C is a compromised bone. Uh, so in this again, uh, we can uh, do uh, certain measures like osteoplasty. We can use uh, uh, root form implants or we can do augmentation procedure to increase the uh, width of the bone. Division D is a deficient bone which has severe atrophy. And in uh, this case, with severe atrophy uh, and has a flat maxilla. Uh, so basically, uh, ridge augmentation is uh, uh, important in this kind of bone. Coming to radiographic evaluation. So basically, radiographic evaluation is done pre-prosthetically uh, during the surgery and uh, the post-prosthetic uh, phase. Now the objective uh, is basically to identify the disease, determine the bone quantity, determine the bone density, determine the implant position and determine the implant orientation. Now what are the different image modalities which are present? There is a uh, uh, two dimensional and three dimensional. We have uh, most commonly which we use uh, for implant uh, dentistry is the uh, OPG or the uh, CVCT. Now, how do we make a treatment plan? So first we visualize the final prosthesis. We identify the key abutment. We, uh, the, we identify the force factors uh, and the bone density. And uh, we identify the need for the additional implants and the available of bone. Now impression, uh, the procedure uh, is basically first the impression is made uh, and the cast is poured and a diagnostic wax up is done. Then a radio opaque template is fabricated which patient wears during a scan and the uh, teeth position is transferred. So this is basically uh, a, a surgical stand uh, is prepared uh, prepared for a guided implant placement. Uh, Coming to ideal implant positioning guidelines, so the implant should be positioned in relation to the existing teeth, vital structures and other implant. 
so the uh, distance between the implant and the tooth should be around 1.5 to 2 mm uh, the distance between the implant to implant should be around 3 mm and the distance from the inferior alveolar nerve canal uh, so basically the uh, it should be at least uh, placed uh, 2 mm or uh, or more away from the inferior alveolar canal and the mental foramen now uh, distance from the sin maxillary sinus uh, so basically the uh, sa1 is greater than 12 mm of the bone uh, so we use a standard implant protocol sa2 is when there is a 10 to 12 mm of bone present so we use the uh, floor elevation through the osteotomy side sa3 uh, is uh, when 5 to 2 mm bone is present the sinus grafting is indicated and sa4 is less than 5 mm where there is lateral wall or direct sinus uh, lift is required now implant angulation uh, so uh, 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 the angulation should basically follow the uh, 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 the angulation of the natural tooth buccolingually and mesiodistally so the proximity of the adjacent teeth is basically the greatest uh, limiting factor followed by the prosthetic reconstruction so ideally the mesiodistal implant position in the cent uh, should be in the center of the ridge equidistant from uh, the adjacent teeth uh, picogoronally it should be 2 mm from top of the implant to see edge of the missing teeth Now coming to single implant consideration, so the treatment options which are available is the immediate implant placement with or without simultaneous augmentation, early implants with or without simultaneous augmentation, guided bone regeneration, uh, socket preservation, bridge augmentation, and socket shielding. Whereas for multiple implant consideration, we have implant supported removable partial uh, or a prosthetic a prosthesis or an implant supported fixed prosthesis. So the different treatment option for completely dentulous patient can be a removable overdenture that is RP four or RP five, which is, uh, it can be either can be completely supported by implants or can be supported by implants and the soft tissue as well. Uh, the fixed options can be uh, like an all-on for concept, which is given by uh, Paulo Molo, or other fixed options where there are multiple implants are placed followed by a fixed prosthesis. so coming to treatment uh, uh, summary of the treatment plan so we need to have a proper uh, history and examination of the patient uh, then we need to uh, check for the sufficient bone uh, the tissue and the uh, the uh, positioning of the implant a diagnostic mock up or a wax up of the idle tooth has to be done uh, once uh, the uh, uh, once the uh, this uh, uh, has uh, Once the treatment plan has been formulated, the placement of the implant can be carried out. Once the uh, and uh, after that, the provisional restoration can be given. Uh, followed by second stage, a final restoration can be uh, made and maintenance uh, phase can be carried. Out. So uh, these are the references. Thank you.